I've got a copy of Oracle Core, the preview for it. Um, it's a top notch book. I didn't write it, so I can give you an objective view that I, I like. Uh, my name's Conor McDonald, I'm from Perth. Uh, that's there for those that don't know Australia very well. Um, I don't do bioscience because they're boring. Um, if you really want to find out what I do, um, just Google it. You know, that, that's the bio slide of the future. You know, bio slides are a throwback to when you'd see someone who you never ever couldn't find anything out of them. And so they talk about themselves for 10 minutes, right, which doesn't really give you much value. Um, so I won't do it. Um, if you do Google me, I'm not Conor McDonald the footballer, I'm not Conor McDonald the wrestler, um, and I'm not Conor McDonald the award winning bull at the Iowa State Fair. <laughs> um, but fourth one down, that'll be me. Uh, click on that one. Um, so today I'm going to talk about a, a diary of a, a clusterware upgrade. Um, and it's, it's sort of, um, I wanted to talk about this because people like to come to talks and they often get um, glamorized. You know, um, additions of what's going on. They get talks about you know how successful we were. Um, this is a bit more honest. This is about how we just had incredible grief. Um, the best way of describing it is why would I choose to fly 14,726 kilometers to San Fran to um, talk about this? In fact, it's actually further because you have to go Sydney, Auckland, San Fran. So it's a little blue line, and you have to have food like this on the plane, which is not the most pleasant thing. But I'm really, really happy. And the reason I am is because I'm that distance away from our cluster. <laughs> That's basically what the object of this talk was. Why? Because it was just pain. It was just pain for about 18 months of my life. It just about killed me. And to be honest, when I first wrote this talk, it really was just a one hour bridge session about Oracle. You know, it was just basically, these are the upgrades we did. And I was just like so, so bitter about the whole process that I just wanted to sort of unload it. But there's that famous quote about, you know, when you get thrown into things that you didn't really want, uh, you pick up a lot of good stuff. Um, and so, even though it started off as just a sort of an unloading of business, it was more about the journey. You know, we learned a lot about RAC, direct NFS, clusterware, latches, mutexes. So these are the kind of things I want to talk about today. Um, you know, there'll be a tinge of business in there. Um, but yeah, more just a, a journey through what we went through. And so hopefully, you'll learn some stuff and you won't have to go through the same journey. Would you like a different one? Okay, let's do a bit of background. Um, this whole process was for racing in Western Australia. Um, we handle a horse race called the Melbourne Cup. It's one of the fifth biggest, one of the five biggest horse races in the world. Um, it's betting. Yeah. Um, in Australia, people like to bet. They like to bet a lot. Okay? And on this particular day when they held the Melbourne Cup, which is the first Tuesday in November, <coughs> we have the Melbourne Cup, biggest horse race of the year. It's called the race that stops the nation. It's such a big event. They have a public holiday for a horse race. Uh, most of the states actually have the day off work, so you can go bet on the Melbourne Cup. That's how insane big it is. The problem with that is, when you're managing that, if we lose our server, we can drop a million dollars in a minute. That's, that's the, at the worst time, just before the race starts, when everyone's betting, we drop a million dollars a minute if we're down. That's not so good in terms of outages. For 35 years, this client has done that with the mainframe system. They literally wrote a system in the 70s, written in assembler, to do this. Um, and up until about 2007, that's what they were using. So in 2007, they said it's time to modernize the mainframe. just can't do this work anymore. Um, to give you an idea of how impressive the program is from that year of work, it's a 256 megabyte RAM machine handling 1,000 bits a second. That's a really good job at 35 years. We had to build a new system in all these new modern technologies to go live in 2010. And for us, the high availability was what we call a challenge loop. And the challenge loop is this, and, and this is for every system. You want HA, you need to have redundant components. To do that, you need to spend a lot of money. You also have to add a lot of complexity to your system because you're adding a lot more components. And what does complexity do? It removes high availability. That's the challenge of HA. You keep adding stuff in and hope that it actually makes things better. Um, there's that classic Gartner report which says when you first go to clustering, your availability drops in the first year. It's the same thing. Complexity is the enemy of availability. Oracle, HA pretty much means RAC. And RAC is complex. That's the enemy of availability. It's complex software. If you haven't ever used RAC before, no, I, I won't ask for a show of hands because that's always dumb. No. Um, this is the list of acronyms you encounter when you first use RAC. Not when you first use Oracle. 
This is above single instance. You get all these new acronyms in place. And each one of these is some sort of technology. Rack is complex hardware as well. Yeah. That's the classic <laughs> rack picture. Everyone draws rack like that. You know, two boxes, some wine, and some shared storage. It's not really that obvious. You have to go out by host based adapters and then a fiber channel switch. And then, of course, you can't have one because that's not HA. So you have to buy two and you start rewiring the whole place. But you can't use that for the interconnect because you're going to use UDP. So you've got to buy an internet switch, you need two of them because otherwise it'll fall over. And then, actually, people from the outside world might want to actually talk to your database. So you better plug in another switch and some more networking stuff. And then, when you start adding more boxes, you know, it just gets pretty much out of control. HA was really important at this time at a site level as well. For the same reason if they lose the whole site on Melbourne Cup Day, they want us to keep editing. Um, so they took this whole thing and did that. Right? They built what's called an extended distance cluster. You run a cluster across um, two sites. Um, you probably, the people call them EDCs, people also call them stretch clusters, which is like, it's a stretch if you're going to get it to work. That's sort of my view on it. Um, but anyway. Um, so, stretch clusters even get more complicated because now you start having more and more switches here if you're doing storage level replication because you can't just replicate Oracle, you've got other stuff to replicate as well. It gets really complex. You end up with sort of computer rooms, this is not our computer room, but you know, that look like this, just spaghetti of network stuff. There's other complexities. When you've got a rack, you have a local file system, your operating system in your clusterware, you need a cluster file system as well, for your admin area probably, in your archives, you need some other technology, a RAW or ASM for your database itself. You've got a lot of technologies, a lot of hardware, a lot of protocols, a lot of file systems. It's all the enemy of high availability, which is why you went back in the first place. So it's that sort of challenge. There are solutions to this. What are the solutions? Well, option one is you just get someone else to do it. You go buy an appliance, right? And all the complexity is hidden inside the box. Right? And, and I'm not bagging it. ODAs are a great little piece of kit, but it's a bit like this, right? It's like, you know, there's no complexity because I can't see it. <laughs> and and there's, there's, I'm not trying to be bad or but there's a lot of value in going from appliance in that sense. It's like uh, if you buy a car, you don't want to know have to maintain everything about it. But you are effectively buying into the fact that if you have a problem, it's going to take you some time. You have to phone someone and they'll come out and fix your car. So you encounter that delay, which wasn't one well option for this client. Option two is, well, let's keep all that complexity, but try to simplify it as much as we can. What if you could have one protocol for everything? And that's what we did. We used NFS. Ethernet across the board. Right, get rid of the fiber channel, get rid of the host based adapters, just come with what every box comes with nowadays, give it Ethernet or above, and just use Ethernet for the whole lot. Yeah. And the good thing is when you come to add nodes to your rack cluster, you just go down to your local radio shack and buy an Ethernet cable. It just costs like $10. Right, it's really, really simple. It's really, really cheap. Host based adapters for fiber and stuff don't become cheap nowadays. Right, Ethernet's dirt cheap. Um, and what do people say? But Ethernet's slow. Yeah, they go, Ethernet's slow because you know, our, our network at work runs on Ethernet and you know, access to my mail is really slow, so Ethernet's slow. And it's, a lot of it is this sort of real simpleton argument that which one should I point out? You know, gigabit Ethernet, but you know, my father's now, it's 4 gigabit, or it's 8 gigabit, or even 16, I think it's just on its way out. Um, that's true, but Ethernet's great, one of those things you can scale it up to use horrible password, you can bond them together. So you can get a quad Ethernet card and basically you just add them together and then you've got 4 gig. And there's technology advances as well. One gigabit now is passe. Now it's 10 gigabit. You could bond four of them together to get 40. Even 40 gigabit is now available in its own right. And I was just reading on um, the register the other night um, that yeah, they've just abandoned for the time being terabit because they have to change some sort of technology. But they're going to be happy with 400 gigabit Ethernet. Like that is really stomping along. And then people say, well, NFS is slow. You know, we, NFS is some throwback to some workstations from you know, the, the, the 80s. And that's true in its normal implementation. NFS is normally Oracle talks to the OS, OS talks to NFS, and the half maintains the cache and talks to the database. But there's a solution to that, and Oracle gave you one for free. It's called Direct NFS. Direct NFS simply says, well, let's get rid of all that stuff we didn't really need. Let's let me, as the database, talk to my database files. And Direct NFS absolutely rocks. It is super cool. Um, here are some stats from Red Hat. Um, so there's 10 gigabit Ethernet just doing some order entry transactions um, on normal NFS. 
flip it over direct manifest, it goes up by a factor of two. Yeah, that's the same benchmark, same hardware, same everything, just removing all that OS stuff in the middle. Um, compare it to fiber. You're getting close to wire speed, which is really what you want. And we confirmed this. We did direct NFS on our site and under an incredible low direct NFS absolutely knocked our socks off. It was awesome. Um, the best thing about direct NFS, it just puts those fiber channel fanboys in their place. <laughs> um, yeah. Because it's, 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 it's a classic as old fiber. Yeah, it's a speed of light. Yeah. <laughs> um, great site to reference. Um, Kevin's talking later today, I think. But yeah, go to his blog. He's a, just you know, an incredible name. Yeah, I, I can't think of it. Maybe read consistency back here. Or five. I, I think this is the next biggest thing ever in our world. Ash is just insanely good. Um, it's amazing. Um, before Ash in 10G, what did you do? You had to run stats pack, right? Or if you're a dinosaur like the UCL B step, B step. We have third party tools like Precise and stuff, most of them have gone by the wayside. Because what do we do as a, for a living? We respond to this. People phone up, and they say, I've got something running slowly. Um, I had to Google what this is called. So this is called, because um, it used to be an hourglass, which made sense. This is called an infinite progress indicator. <laughs> <laughs> that is so true. <laughs> and, and what did we, yeah, in the old days, what did we do? We would respond with things like this. You know, um, CPU's 45 percent, the buffer cache is running at 99. You know, we've detected no problems over the last 20 minutes. <laughs> you know, and users aren't happy with that. You know, yeah, they're still putting this infinite progress indicator. It's too high level. So then we go to the opposite extreme. Once we actually learned what we were doing as DBAs, we started using SQL trace. That's too low level. Because A, it can be intrusive, especially if you're dumping a lot of, say, level 12 data. And what's for is, it's that great thing where a user's phone up, having pain, and you say, that's great. Could you do it again? <laughs> because we need to trace it now. And again, it's not a great way of enamoring yourself. To your that's where Ash came in. Ash is that thing where basically every active session, every second, is being recorded. It's just awesome. Um, and the best thing is when you start the database, so memory is allocated or pre-allocated for Ash. Right? The cool thing with that is, is it's very low overhead. It's done with the background process. It's not your own process taking responsibility for recording all that stuff. And there's no latching. Because the memory is being pre-allocated, Oracle just no longer work and write the memory in a, effectively a circular buffer. Um, and that's why when you query Ash disk out of the box, it always tends to start with the most recent data and work its way backwards. Um, and this is probably um, a terrible sin against Graham, who explained this to me in great detail once I sort of simplified it down to this. It writes in a circular buffer in this direction, and you read it in the opposite direction. That's why you don't need to latch the memory to read it. You just basically start at the very last point and work its way backwards. And that's a great thing because you can bell to layer Ash without doing matching problems. Right, it's very, very cool. Um, the way Ash works by default is when it runs out of that memory, it dumps every 10th sample, um, I think, to DBA his blah, 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 But um, we don't even do that at my client. We actually have a job that actually unloads the raw Ash data and just keeps it for like months and months. Because it's amazing how, especially in a betting environment, someone will come along and say, on the horse race of interest three weeks ago, we noticed that our betting you know, was a little bit down. Can you see if there was any performance issues? So I love keeping Ash data for as long as possible. It's just so cool. It's very cool. But it's a diagnostic pack and it's worth every cent. Um, some alternatives, if you can't afford it, um, Tanoff has a great snapper, uh, which is like a homegrown version of Ash. I think Carl, Carl, Carl has something similar. Um, I have a link for you, so I um, But yeah, it's worth it. Um, but anyway, back to direct DirectNFS. So that's one of the segue off. Um, 60 seconds, IO is a bag. It was a bug. Thank God. Um, and that's the story of our upgrade. Okay, so I'm 120 slides in, we've done the intro, now we can talk about the upgrade. <laughs> um, the recommendation came from Oracle that we should go from 11106 to 11107. That's our first upgrade. Um, sorry, and that was on April 2010. Sorry, I'm, I'm Australian, I used the month and day. I think that stuff. So that's, that's month and year. Um, no issue for 11107 for AIX. Uh, does that work on AIX? <laughs> <laughs> this is not me. This is in the read me. <laughs> so that was upgrade number one came to a rapid halt. So then they said 11.9071. Um, that was an in-place upgrade from the CRS. So if you're on one and you're on rack, uh, upgrading CRS is in-place, which is a little bit risky because um, it's very tough to back out. But luckily that 
they find it. That's why you always got to limit to or above if you're ever using rack. Um, but we upgraded that instrument, that actually went fine. Our 60 second IOs disappeared. Fantastic. They got replaced with three second IOs. Um, still not so flash. So we went back to support and raised a 72 on the 26th of May 2010. Um, a week later, there was no response. You know, started no response. We escalated it. Ten days later, and we still had no response from support. <laughs> um, so then, our client said, "Look, take this to server um, one." And once again, this thing weighing off here. Um, my recommendation is don't use set one unless it's the absolute last resort. Now that sounds weird because you pay a lot of low forums. The reason I don't like using set one is one is if you do have a real cataclysmic error. Uh, there's a bit of that cry wolf kind of syndrome if you didn't. But the other one is, you get this thing called follow the sun support. Right? What that means it means for eight hours, someone's going to help you and start to learn your intimate details of your problem. Right? And then eight hours' time, just when they're really just about to solve it, they're going to go off shift. And someone else is going to come on. Right? And that's not a criticism of them, that's just a fact of life. And then someone else comes on, they'll go, now what's your platform? <laughs> This thing where you just go round and round and round, right? And so it's, it's not a criticism of support, it's just a fact of life. You're almost better off just to knuckle down through it. Um, so that way you get to stay with the same region. So on June 17th, we finally found out after set one again, phoning all sorts of people, that we actually needed more than 11 models set one. There were a number of bugs known with direct NFS, uh, particularly pertaining to AIX, uh, that we had to fix. So what I'm stressing is, even when someone says, apply this version, apply this patch, just always put back in the SR, can you please confirm that? Just to clarify that extra time, just to make them stop and think that they haven't just grappled out, oh, please put the next patch on and see how we go. Because they'll often say, next patch on, we're sure that'll fix it, without actually possibly confirming that. So we found this Q-Pax for direct NFS and we applied that. The problem is, on 11.1071, you couldn't apply. It was a conflict. You had to go to 11.073 before you could apply that patch. So that was our third upgrade. We read just the database from 7.1 to 7.3. Um, and then we tried to apply to try apply this patch. And OPAC said, no, it conflicts with other patches. And we've been given some dark bugs. Actually, you couldn't put that patch on 11.1073. We decided to stay on 11.1073 anyway, because we'd moved forward a bit. We'd applied a lot of database patches. We thought we'd get some value out of that. And that leads on to the next topic, new Texas. Now, quick background before I talk about mutexes. Let's, let's do a woeful metaphor, because I'm really good at woeful metaphors. When I showed this in the presentation, I laughed just as I run through this, you know, see what she said. Um, she said, you know, she said, you have a real gift with metaphors. She said, it's a gift that should be taken back to the shop. <laughs> uh, she, calls them, she calls them metaphors. Anyway, <laughs> this is my metaphor. <laughs> a, a public toilet, right, is a complex apparatus. But we generally don't want to share this resource with other people. <laughs> so how do we protect ourselves from that? We do this simple structure in front of it. It's called a latch. That's how a toilet works and it avoids problems. It's the same with memory. It's the metaphor. You know, we've got two people trying to access a complicated memory structure like linked lists. You know, ever, had, ever had that surprise when you went from 32 bit to 64 bit Oracle and your SJ had to go up by a factor of just to have the same performance, because all the pointers got twice as big. And all was like 60% pointers. It's all these linked lists just floating around everywhere, doubly linked lists and everything. So, yeah, it's complicated memory in our So we protect it with latches. We serialize the access, right, such that two people don't conflict. So it sort of looks like this in very So, firstly, you walk in, you get the latch, right? Once you've got it, you're allowed to access, access the memory to form a complicated operation. <laughs> and then you release the latch, and you're done. That's how it works. The library caches are classic structure. You know, a lot of people are competing for that memory. So there's a lot of stuff in it. To protect it, uh, we use latches. There's, just, there's so much stuff in the library cache, there's 131,000 buckets, and each bucket contains lots of stuff. Right? And that's protected by 67 latches in most versions of Oracle about 11 point something. Um, I can't remember the exact version. Because there are less latches than buckets, one latch protects a range of buckets. What does that mean? You might get some false latch contention. You know, I want bucket 17, someone else wants bucket 32, but they're both protected by the same latch. So you might get some false latch contention. Now for good apps, they don't contend with library cache anyway. 
this isn't that they do it initially, but they just run sweet up. Bad apps, not so much. You know, bad apps can get really bad lapse contention. And you can tell because when smoke starts coming out of your server, you basically get some parsing storm. Right? So I hate the fact that Oracle invented this thing called mutexes to solve the bad app problem. I'd rather we solve the bad app problem by having good apps. There you go. What are mutexes? They're light matches, but they're lightweight, they're smaller, and they're faster. Because of that, you can have more. And the way the library cache works in 11 is there's actually a mutex spec every single bucket. So you eliminate the false latch contention, or mutex contention. They're lightweight, they're small, they're faster, and they're brand new. <coughs> Suddenly, you get some issues with them. We've got to have some fun. Go into Metal League. Sorry, support whatever. And just do library cache mutex and just hit search. Right? And you get like a blue slew of bugs. Right? Um, and once again, I'm not happy to go over it. Any software I write that's brand new also is full of bugs. We all do that. Right? So this is a brand new sort of you know, interface, a brand new low-level structure. There's a lot of challenges with it. In AIX, if you're not familiar, we use a tool called Enmon. It's just an ASCII way of looking at the CPU and other metrics in the system. So when we did our first load test back in 11.7.1, um, in the race that stops the nation, it looked a bit like this. Okay? And this is what we were expecting. We don't hardware capacity for about this requirement. Running at 1,000 bits a second, we sat at about 70% on the PCs. Right? And that was what we expected. We were pretty happy with that. 11703, which we've gone to to try to solve direct NFS issues, it looked like this. It was absolutely peaked out at 100%. The race that stops the nation actually became the race that stops the server. Um, because we run rack nodes at 100%. Eventually, some cluster stuff starts to struggle to get us to the slice of the pie, and that node generally gets evicted um, or just dies. So this was a bit of a problem. It was a bug. Uh, wait on library cache. Mutex X for calling peel SQL packages. Uh, we were getting this slug by one of these new bugs. Uh, to mutex, the server was spinning a lot of CPU and maxing out. This tells us, and this is the same, I think, from about, probably since about 9.2, I reckon. There's no such thing as a small upgrade here. We changed the fifth digit from 1 to 3, and we inherited a brand new low-level mutex infrastructure. That's just how it is. There's no such thing as minor upgrades anymore in Oracle. Just be cognizant of that. We went back to support and they said, Pete's upgrade to 11107 too. <laughs> <laughs> we said, we're on 11107.3. And they said, oh, oh, I'm staying to do stuff for free. Now, in our peel signal layer, we've written an instrumentation layer called MSG, uh, message. Right? And just everything we did, every parameter that came in, we'd write out, you know, we'd store, I should say, not store out what the story was. Um, and, you know, just lots and lots of instrumentation everywhere. Now obviously, if you're trying to do a thousand bits a second, you probably don't want to have each one of these doing an insert into a table, unless things aren't running so good. Um, so we log it to a local appeal SQL table, and then people say, well that's great, but only that says you can see it. How do I get access to that instrumentation? And so we built our own little thing using local context. And I just thought I'd share that with you because you might want to use it yourself. And you want to welcome to copy this package if you want to just get to We have a context, and you can actually key these contexts into global context by your session ID. What does that mean? A global context is effectively a memory structure that can be accessed across session. And that's what's really cool for debugging. Because the session's doing the work and say, look at that context, have I been asked to debug, for example, to a table? Yes, I have. Okay, all my MSG calls now live to a table. Have I been asked to switch off? Okay, I stopped doing it. And from another session, I can be DBA and say, put a little message in that context saying, please start buying all your stuff to a table because I know you're having problems, and please turn it off again. Um, and just to give you a quick example of how that works, you create a context which stacks this globally, you write a package to actually bask into that context, and that's the package content, but it just uses the DBA session set context. But this is really the crux of it. I identify myself in some way, right, and that flicks me and says that, and it says that's the value I've set. I can log in my another session and ask for the value of that context, and I get the same value. It's two sessions sharing memory. Right? And that's the perfect thing you want to do cross session messaging uh, in a nice simple compression. Uh, this razor fast because accessing this context doesn't do a select from the jewel like you used to back in 9 or 10. So it's very cool. Anyway, that led to another problem for us. There's another bug with new text is when you access context variables. 
Um, so we were getting slugged when we called our peel sequel on mutexes, and that peel sequel was calling context many, many times, and they were having mutex problems as well, and that's why we did get out. So we compromised. Um, what we did was we took our instrumentation layer and we took out the peer identifier at the end just to halve that amount of calls, and we took all our MSG calls and wrapped them with conditional compilation, which we didn't want to do, but that's you know, we were one month from go live, we just said we're going to have to rip all this instrumentation out or at least have it toggleable so we can actually recompile stuff that we need to put it back in. So, conditional compilation, another little segue, it's good value, good fun to do. But ultimately, we failed. Right? We put all these things in place, but we were so close to go live that the client said, it's just too much risk. We just can't do this. Um, so, on November 15, 2010, we went live on 11074. But it was two weeks after the Melbourne Cup for that year. Right? They just couldn't take the risk. Right? They stayed on the mainframe for that one year. Right? And it just got through it. Um, it was a very, very touchy go, but they actually used the mainframe. So the Mutex issue, we now had 351 days until the next Melbourne Cup <laughs> to solve it. <laughs> January 2011, right? we found this bug on Middling. Um, you know, there was excessive library cache Mutex contention. 11202. Um, and also, a really cool blog for low level stuff is this one. It um, talks about mutex and stuff, and he confirmed it. He said, That's the patch set you want. So, we did an 112 database test, just loaded up a single instance, did a load test, and yeah, the mutex problem was gone. Right? So, that comment about there's too much PLC, um, there's a term for that, that's called bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so, it took all my restraint not to go back into the middle and say, About your comment. <laughs> So, 11 2 database, fantastic. You know, we, our mutex problem has gone away, our uh, load test confirmed it. But 11 2 database means 11 2 plus 2. And for us, that's a big change. You never use 10 G rack, there's three little processes in the rack. You have the plus 2 web. Right? You go to 11 and you get 8. Hmm. You go to 11 2, and it's just a little bit different. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I sort of get that feeling it was pretty much almost like a, a, a rewrite or a repo. Right? And then, so do you. So our fifth upgrade on February 2011 was our development cluster. Uh, and that's just a segue off again. Um, if you're running RAC in production, make sure you run RAC to test and get uh, all the way through. Otherwise, you'll have nothing to pay. So we went 11.074 to 11.202, just the cluster web. So this is how our cluster looked at the start. We upgraded one to 11.2, and that was fine. But in doing so, we destroyed the cluster on the other node, in 11.1. And that was unexpected. So we and the reason was an AIX, there's this thing called HAIP, high availability IP, 11.2 cluster where it's as big as a lot more stuff nowadays. Right? It takes over the IP stack, like a better term, and says, well, that's got to be HA, so I'll look after it for you. It, you know, it reaches out a much further than just a database nowadays. And AIX, which has a very good IP stack, uh, had a few issues with that. Right? They just didn't talk to it. And so effectively, Oracle said, you know, there's a problem here with the IP stack, I can't make a HA, therefore I'm not having a cluster. And that's effectively what happened. So Oracle said, look, deinstall it, we'll give you a patch, and we'll go again. So the 11.2 deinstall is really good. It comes as a separate download now. It's a separate product, so to speak. You download the deinstall, you run it. And what happened was, it deinstalled 11.2. Deinstalled 11.1. And deinstalled our whole cluster. <laughs> <laughs> it is really, really thorough. Right. So, um, very impressive product. Uh, so, luckily, you know, and this is an example of, of reaching out beyond their link. Um, we found some information on the International Rap Music Group from a guy named Julian Dyke. And the HAIP problem was due to multicasting. Um, out of the box, um, the cluster went multicast on this, on this address, which is great if you're on Linux, um, not so flashy if you're on the AX. Um, there was a patch, we let it multicast on different IP addresses, and that was the patch you needed. So if you're ever using Rack on AIX or in fact any port, there's a multicast utility. Before you install, you download it and it tells you, okay, you know, is it all going to be okay when I install? Rather than finding this out after you install. Uh, 11203 has this as part of the install now. So it's important. So we had another go, right? This time it was go to 11202, this time with the app set as well. And that worked. And the DB upgrade was fine, there were no mutex issues, and we were very, very happy. So on April 1st, full day, we tried our next development cluster using the exact same process. Clusterware plus this patch. 
It did work. <laughs> Um, and these are identical boxes, you know, and well, we were promised they were, and as far as we can tell, they all do have a sort of a, a pre-built OS image. We never told them, they said, you need a new patch. Um, you know, we've discovered some problems, that, that there's some problems in the cluster where we're going to timing on AIX. So depending on how busy the box was, how powerful it was, how fast things ran, the cluster where upgrade might work or might not. That was particularly good. Ah, so this new patch is going to fix it. So now we tried this one, which was clusterware upgrade plus the multicast patch plus this new patch. Um, the problem was they had a patch conflict. It wouldn't let you do that patch and that patch together. So they said go to 11.2.0.2.2. We merged those two patches and put them into the patch set there. So we tried that. That was our rate right upgrade. We had a crack at that, and that's success. You know, the clusterware said, yep, yeah, I'm done. Until we tried to upgrade the database. The database said, <laughs> upgrade cannot proceed, the cluster is not healthy. So we went back to support and we said, we get this message, data plate upgrade we cannot proceed. Seven days later they said, please proceed. <laughs> 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 um, luckily on an O10 forum, we found a, a post that said, we've seen this as well, if you actually shut down both nodes of the cluster to zero and then start up again, the problem goes away. It's just a sort of like, you know, one node was up, one node was down, kind of issue. So we actually had some success. So this is a quick summary of where we are. Cluster with, with 11.202 in a patch, cluster to 11.202.02, um, and they both have been successful. So then we started getting into the more serious nodes, our user acceptance test one, we were one away from production. That one was just successful the first time. That was, you know, we thought we finally got on something that we can now follow consistently. And so this is what we've done, right? and we're happy until about a few days later, we stopped the database from trying to start up, and it wouldn't. Um, and it had a listing that I couldn't attach to the cluster anymore. And this is just hot luck. You know, we don't really shut our databases down, we just shut them down for some other reason. And yet, it just wouldn't actually attach to the cluster anymore. We had half the cluster. We could bring up one half of the cluster in the database, but if we tried to bring up the other, it wouldn't until we shut that one down. Uh, now, recall, they said there's a new patch that would go on with the old patch that had been merged with this patch set update. We were back to support and they said, well actually, we were wrong about that. We didn't actually put those patches in at all. We'd just been lucky with that timing issue. That you had. <laughs> they said, please apply this patch on top of 11.202.02. Um, by that stage, we were starting to get a little bit stressed. <laughs> um, especially when we downloaded this patch and it says, actually no, it conflicts with 11.202.02. You can't put it on. And we got very, very stressed <laughs> out. Especially as they go, oh, not that. that. Patch. 
another patch. The only positive thing out of this whole experience was while we were doing this, they said, we are working on a non-flash version of you know, support or Which thankfully is now a place that you've probably discovered. So wasn't that just like the worst experience of our lives? The flash version? <laughs> so here's where we were. Right, we had 11202 plus two, plus two patches. We went back and applied those same patches to all the clusters and they were all working. So what can I bet on? No, we did that. The other one is actually taking the money. Yeah, contributing to the whole of the society. That's what I did for living. <laughs> September 13th, 49 days to go, we said we'll do our first one. <laughs> what was planned was this. 10 p.m. we do a full backup, 11 o'clock update, one, if you can see what's going on. No two, do the upgrade. By 4 o'clock we'd be ready for business at 7 a.m. the next day. Let's see what happened. 10 p.m. we did the full backup, 11 p.m. we upgraded no one, and it failed, but we expected that to fail because of the HII problem. We had to reboot, run those deep config things, hack the parameters, and it was okay. So at that point it was fine. We then did node number two, and we knew that would fail as well because we had this post patching sort of set of operations to do it before. We did that, and it did work. It didn't come up. We had never seen this before. It was a new scenario. So at 2 a.m., we made the call, so we were back out. Yeah, we had to basically stop CRS, start 11 months CRS. That didn't work. Things were getting a bit fun. At 3 a.m., we said, it's all too hard, full restore. Both boxes. All file systems, full restore from that happened. So we did try to start 11 months, and it still didn't start. That was at 4 a.m. Um, this was not so flash. At 4 a.m., because I, I was at a different site, I had to phone the operators, the system operators, and say, I need the CEO to go on, because we aren't going to be up tomorrow. Um, and while I was waiting for them to find this, um, I actually sort of uh, logged on to our data warehouse and looked at what, what our takings were for the last year on the same day. It was about $5 billion. So I got, now I knew that we were about to lose $5 million. Um, it's nice to know in advance yeah, how your career is about to be. <laughs> it's like a, like, you know, a spiraling pit into despair. <laughs> it's just not a fun time. But then there's, you know, when you're at your lowest, you often have the light bulb moments. And once again, it's that classic outsourcing thing. We've asked someone to do a full restore. They've restored all the local file systems, but they haven't restored the shared file systems. Um, and so they had the, the OCR and voting list was still left at 11.2 versions. So we restored the OCR, reinitialized the voting list, and thankfully we could restart 11.1 CRS. Got that done at 5 o'clock. 6 a.m. we got everything restarted, and 7 o'clock was just another day. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of those great things where, and you get those great emails from management going, I hear you had a few dramas last night. Yeah, and, and that's, that's the level of support here. Yes, we did. We went back to support, and I said, oh, it's a known issue. <laughs> yeah, that you didn't know, but we did. They said you could solve this by setting this reminder before you run the upgrade. Set the PIOS alloc equals early. We had 32 days left now before Melbourne Cup. The mutex issue meant we had to upgrade. We couldn't stand 11.1074 in production because we wouldn't be able to cope with the load. So we had two clusters left. We had one that we, the bed inquiry one, and we had the back one. And management, we, we had, a, to their credit, we had a meeting in a room, and they said, look, we're in a rock and a hard place, we're going to roll the dust. We're going to go our, our main, our core system, one that takes people's money, you know, we're going to roll that and see how we go. And so, yeah, folks. Then they said, good luck, Connor, we'll see you after the upgrade. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was planned? I said, well, I've got some conditions on this. We're starting at 6 pm, we're starting at 10 pm. We'll do a full backup, we'll do the exact same thing, and hopefully by 1 in the morning we'll be ready for business. What happened? We did the full backup. This time we sent PS Alec in early and started the upgrade, and that just ran through. We didn't even need to do the deconfig and reboot all that stuff, we just ran through, right? It took a bit longer, it did a bit more work, right? And that's a key point we'll come back to. I thought it actually worked. We then started mode number two, straight away after that, 10 past that, and commenced, right? And if you ever are doing upgrades in the cluster, in fact, any kind of maintenance in the cluster, this is a really good location to go look at. It has all these logs of what's going on, and you can work out what it's actually up to. When we looked at that, we found that by 10 p.m. it was about 10% complete. And we said, this is not normal. <laughs> I log onto the box, and this is what it looks like. It is absolutely pegged out on system calls. And I log back to node 1, and it was also pegged out on system calls. And then I had that light bulb moment. This is why it had taken two hours to upgrade the first node. Something had gone previously wrong. And this was the time for a set 1. So we did log a set 1. We got routed to Europe. 
Having phone the night before us, we're doing our biggest upgrade of all time. We need the same resources we've had all the time on site for a call. Uh, they said, yeah, that's not a problem. We actually found out later they were actually waiting for our call. We couldn't get through the call routing process because we phoned after hours and the guy said, I can't work through Australia. Are you going to Europe? So we got some guy in Hungary who had never heard of us. Um, that wasn't much fun. So we said, this is where we are. We got no one's on 11.2, it's running 100%. No one's upgrading to 11.2, it's running 100%. We could really use some help by the way, because it's stuck. And we got this. My best, we'll get back to you. <laughs> and I just sat there, I was, was funny, I was in an empty room, empty office, because everyone else was going home. No, no one wants to be around risky upgrades. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just sitting in this totally empty building, and it's whisper quiet. But you sit there for 90 minutes like this. <laughs> That's a very, very, very bad time. And while you're sitting there, you know, so by 90 minutes you've gone, we're at 20%. You know, and you're just, you're just you're stressing out your brain. Um, and so yeah, you think of things through. So I did an article trust on the upgrade screen. I said, what the hell is going on? Why is it running so slow? And it looked like this. Right? And this, these disc lamps just spewed out onto the screen as fast as my terminal can do it. I don't know, I'm not a system program, I have no idea what this thing means, so I yeah, used the reference book called Google. <laughs> this is from AX memory. And the second thing that comes up is understanding paging space allocation policies. I go, hmm, that's three words I haven't heard of before, but it does look very, very familiar. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, that's one of those things where we really should have stopped there. <laughs> but I'm not, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not predicting the more problems. Yeah, we've done the clusterware, we have the, the database now to upgrade as well. But and, and this is a, a message about having tired stuff. It's really, in all you know, seriousness, like we should have stopped there. I couldn't. I literally said, I cannot come back another night and do this to myself. I just can't cope with this. I'm, you know, I'm going to either kill myself tonight, or I, you know, I can't come back to do this. It was just too, too stressful. So I said, we're, we're, we're charging on. Thankfully, the database upgrade just ran through as database upgrades want to do. Very easily. 5 a.m., we actually got success. 6 a.m., we finished a backup. And six, about 6.45 a.m., it actually was, we got services back online, in ready for just time delay on sunset. Not the next day. And yes, that classic thing when you get an email, you know, like, you know, upgrade completed, some issues noted. Yes, yes, yes. So 30 days later, on November 1st, 2011, um, on the biggest horse racing uh, day of the year in Australia, if not one of the five biggest ones in the world, they said it was the smoothest film that they ever had in the whole race, because the mainframe was always so touch and go. So that's something I was incredibly proud of. Um, the fallout to this day, I found out just recently, our original one that we failed the production upgrade, upgrade on, that was still 11.1 up until recently. We never actually upgraded it, we actually plugged it into a new cluster at 11.2 um, because no one wants to do upgrades from cluster anymore. Um, the worst thing is the world keeps moving. You know, since we've done that, there's been five significant pack set updates for cluster none of which we put off because we're just broken um, by the process. Um, and you know, they're not trivial, that's the list of bugs in those things. Now that seems like a lot. It's not. That's the limit of what PowerPoint can do on a motion scroll for text. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I just showed you. This is the list of bugs. <laughs> um, personal fallout. I dropped seven kilos in a month. <laughs> so it was, it was good for this. Uh, but yeah, it, was just, it wasn't a good time. So just to wrap it up, because we're out of time. So recommendations. You know, in the good old days, Oracle was a software company. Right? They're not a software company, they're a <coughs> solutions company. Right? Engineering solutions, I even said the buzzword for the conference. Um, they sell hardware and software. Right? So it's in their interest for you to buy their stuff. Um, if you're going to dip your toe in the Oracle water, you, know, you really have to like just go the whole lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a discussion on the mailing list I was having this morning with people, people asking about AIX. AIX kit, I love it. It is rock solid. It is awesome. Right? And I love Oracle Database. I use it forever. I think it's awesome. Um, they don't go that well in the same room together. Um, which is unfortunate because AX Kit is awesome. Um, so you really, you know, I have, must say, I hate to say it, if you're going Oracle, you probably want to go the whole stack on Oracle. Um, just because, you know, use a primary port, you don't know what that is, it's not AX. Um, you're going to get a better product and better support. You know, it's just one of those unfortunate facts of life. Um, 11.203 is almost the end of that journey. Thank you very much for yours, it was early, and um, enjoy the rest of the conference.